Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to start my presentation of Annie Alumba's Colonialism slash Post-Colonialism, which is a super important text, and I'm going to explain why for a number of different reasons, but before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, you can go and check out my some 250 episodes I already have up. You can like, share, subscribe if you want to see episodes every time they come up every week, sometimes twice a week. You can follow me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo if you're interested in that. If you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find it on YouTube. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form if you're just into the audio. And if you want to help me out, you can do all those things like share, subscribe. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And so yeah, let's jump into Annie Alumba's colonialism slash post-colonialism. Now this is going to be in two parts. Just by the way that it's structured, the first part's going to be a little bit shorter than the second. So the first part is going to cover chapters or the introduction in chapter one, and then the second part is going to cover chapters two, three, and the conclusion. So the second part will probably be a little shorter. And this is a super important text for a few different reasons. But it's a great introductory text to the study of post-colonialism and colonialism. But it's not just that. It'd be wrong to think of it as just a way to enter into this field. Because since first having read this, which has probably been, God, approaching 10 years ago now, I, I first read this text. Since then, I've actually had the time to go and read all the texts that Lumba is referring to here. And once you know all of these texts, you just get such, there's so much more to this book. Lumba is just really unparalleled in, in, in this stuff. And the insights that she brings to the table are just, they're, they're largely unrivaled, in my opinion. So with that being said, as we go through this, she makes so much, many references to so many disparate fields, be it Marxism, feminist, feminism, post-structuralism. And what I'm going to do is try to provide, provide as much context as I can as we go through it. So to be able to explain what she means by something, what she means when she draws upon Foucault or Marx or uh, Spivak, I should be able to provide some information there for you. So let's jump into this with the introduction. So since the first edition of this text, she's really musing on this, she's, she's meditating on this, uh, in 1998, post-colonial studies has gained in prominence in academia which has been really a 21st century phenomenon as far as its study in well, pretty much every institution. And, you know, some, you can find it a lot in English departments and maybe, uh, you know, cultural studies, sociology departments, but it's really grown as a field of study. And it has drawn, really because of that as well, it has drawn the ire and the anger of many people who think that, it's just trying to bring down the West. It's trying to just challenge Western values, which if anyone says that, then to me, that just reads as more of a justification for post-colonial studies. Because if reading the testimony, narratives, literature of people who've been colonized, if that is threatening to a nation, to a culture, then it means that that culture or nation has been complicit in the subjugation of those people who are being read in uh, post-colonialism departments or in, you know, in English departments, the study of post-colonialism, however you want to characterize it. And this, the, really, this is such an important field of study because, you know, by the 1930s, almost 90%, like, like 85 or something percent of the world's surface or countries on earth uh, or the world surface was colonized by, which are two very different things, of the world surface was colonized by Europe, which is just such a, it's just, it's a mind boggling figure, at, at least I think. And so even though there is this monolithic, there has been this monolithic enterprise to take control of the earth, largely by Europe and European countries who share many values, they're, they are very different. Despite that though, one of the central themes of this book is to try to be try to go as specific and as nuanced as we can when we actually sit down and try to understand the colonial process and what it means to be post-colonial 
what it means to come after colonialism, if such a thing can even be said to exist, especially if the effects of colonialism are still being felt. Now, part of the book as well is Lumba's effort to even criticize some elements of post-colonialism or post-colonial studies for, for a few different reasons. They, it tends to be very compartmentalized, and it tends to be uh, people tend to play on certain teams within post-colonial studies where you'll have people who submit to total post-structuralist understandings of, of colonialism. And this dovetails with emphasizing cultural identity over maybe emphasizing economic conditions or economic factors that contributed to colonialism and therefore the effects of it afterwards in post-colonialism. So what she wants to try to do is try to undo this kind of these camp-like affiliations or these team-like affiliations within post-colonialism to try to bring them together, to try to think about these experiences of that people have gone through, uh, often horrific experiences, and to understand them in as close to their own terms as possible, which means in a lot of cases, departing from Eurocentric models of understanding experiences of colonization, be it through Marxism, post-structuralism, or Western feminism. And that and there's another thing where post-colonialism suffers from a certain cult of personality, where the same few figures are read over and over and over again within post-colonial theory, like Homi Baba, like Gayatri Spivak, like Edward Said. And these often come at the expense of real people who have written or spoken about their own experiences within a colonial empire or living under colonial rule or in the vestiges um, coming after it. So that's going to put us here into chapter one, titled Situating Colonial and Postcolonial Studies. And in this chapter, we're going to do a lot of definitional work. And we're going to look at the history of the emergence of postcolonial theory, because postcolonial theory is largely indebted to, you know, whether this is good or bad, it, you know, it's up for debate, but it is indebted to European histories of, uh, of critical theory and of theory from, we can go all the way back to Marx and the legacies from Marx all the way to, through to Foucault. And we're going to outline all of those here at least in a little bit of detail. But before then, it's important to really staple down how we can understand terms like colonialism, imperialism, neocolonialism, and post-colonialism. What are these things? How do they relate to one another? Well, she gives us the definition or provides the definition of colonialism as the conquest and control of other people's lands and goods other people's land and goods. Now, it's important to note that with this definition, it's not reducible to a European phenomenon. Colonialism, if we accept this definition, has been conducted by many different empires all throughout history, uh, not just Europe. There have been endless attempts by people all across the world, pretty much for all of human history, to take what isn't theirs, to go to somebody else's land or their property or home and take what is not theirs for themselves. So is there something specific or different about European colonization then? And I have my own thoughts on this and I'll sprinkle them through, but it's important to recognize that there is something different. Just quantitatively, if you recall that figure I just gave earlier that Europe had colonized 85% of the world's surface we, we are presented with something unprecedented in the history of human kind. Uh, and this isn't to say that any kind of colonialism is good. It's just that this kind of colonialism is particularly bad. It's just, it's deplorable. It, uh, just uh, at the scale that it is conducted, it was conducted is just unimaginable. Now, why did this happen? Why did Europe have such an immense, expansive, imperial uh, imperial empires, or imperial empires, the expansive empires. Well, it kind of depends who you read. So some Marxists will say that 
it just so happened this way because European efforts to colonize coincided with the emergence of capitalism and the early roots of capitalist exploitation. Now, anyone listening might say, well, I mean, when did when did Columbus travel to the quote-unquote Americas in the early-ish 1500s? That's a little bit before capitalism, uh, and I think that you'd have a point. But the point is that by and large, some of the broadest European expansions occurred in 19th, uh, 18th, 19th century Europe when capitalism was starting to really gear up, when its roots were beginning to, when its, when its seeds were beginning to sprout. And it makes sense insofar as you can only exploit your own people so much before they start getting annoyed. And you're going to need to start keeping them happy because they're also the people who are going to be taking care of the rich people of the bourgeois within a certain country. So it makes sense to try to find cheap, easy labor overseas, not to mention to look for resources that you might not be able to grow or harvest or find in your country. So if you are guided by the drive for profit, then you are going to be you're really going to seek uh, to circumvent any barriers or borders that might hinder your search for profit. Hence the desire to go anywhere to find to find resources, to find avenues for capital. Now, some Marxist traditions give us a point of distinction, provide us a point of distinction between colonialism and imperialism. So, for example, Lenin believed that imperialism is inextricably tied to finance capitalism that tries to gain a hold over another country, over another territory, without necessarily enforcing that hold through direct rule, but instead maintaining a hold over a territory or country through indirect market uh, regulations, through uh, economic exploitation, that places countries into indebtedness to other countries. Now, this is a very narrow way to understand imperialism. If we understand imperialism a little more broadly as just the effort to expand empire, then it can have many different forms. It's not just going to be about finance capitalism. But in any case, it's an important point to consider in that it is possible to maintain a hold over another country or territory, not through direct rule, but through indirect forms of coercion and control. And just in this case that Lenin gives us, it happens to be one coordinated by the economy, by finance capitalism. Now, there are other things to consider here, how like the United States today, and especially when this second edition was coming out after just in the post 9-11 period, American imperialism was it, it didn't just deploy indirect means of coercion and control through the markets. It sent militaries. It sent its troops to seal economic futures for the United States to make sure that there was going to be an abundant supply of oil that was going to be guarded and maintained. And the same thing with the Gulf War to maintain these controls over these populations, not just indirectly, but very much directly as well. So Lumba wants us to think here of imperialism as something else. She wants us to think of it as originating from the metropolis, from the country of origin, really the, the center of that country of origin, and its result is colonialism. So imperialism is more a guiding logic, the expansion of empire, and that is realized through colonialism, which is the exercise of that extension of empire. So she also suggests that this can be used to understand neo-colonialism and neo-imperialism neo as just ways in which they manifest themselves today, very much within the 21st century, in the late 20th century. Now this brings us to post-colonialism. That is, what is post-colonialism? And it's an incredibly complicated term because it really encourages us to ask a number of questions. Does it refer to a place that has completely emancipated itself from colonial rule? If so, then how has it done this? 
uh, is it a place that still belongs to a colonizer, but all aggression has faded away? Is that post-colonial? Uh, is this a place in which the people have been assimilated to such an extent that there is no attachment to the previous cultures, pre-colonial cultures there? Is that a post-colonial state or territory or culture or people? What is the difference between post-colonial and neo-colonial? If post-colonial and neo-colonial are opposed, then that implies that post-colonial is indeed an experience as a moment without colonial rule, whereas neo-colonial is an extension of previous colonial rule or the imposition of new, new colonial rule. But in any case, that implies then that post-colonial is the absence of colonial rule. And so all of these questions, I think, really should get it, really set the tone for this book in emphasizing the complexity of this field of study and the complexity of even imagining beyond that what it might look like for agency, for subjectivity on the part of colonized people. Now, these complexities intensify when we consider as well experiences of people who are attached to, in this, let's just say Europe, people who are attached to Europe, who shed their attachment to Europe. So for example, like America. America is, uh, in its founding, was a group of Europeans who shed their attachment to what they believe to be a colonial empire, uh, a colonizer. Is that a post-colonial setting? Should there be room within post-colonial studies to consider that experience? And the immediate answer would be no, because it's like every single day, within the United States, everyone is reminded of that history. It's just baked into the zeitgeist of American daily culture. But I think it's an important question nevertheless, in that it is, for all intents and purposes, an example of a post-colonial society. Now, it also encourages us to ask, what sense can we make then of people who are still subordinated within a supposedly post-colonial, after-colonial society? Are they still under some kind of colonial rule? Especially if we consider people like women, like children, who undergo much more harm and oppression than in a lot of cases men who are seen by colonial rule, especially from Europe, as being um, more, you know, people who are um, more likable or better allies as far as the colonial struggle goes. Or another good example is a place like within Canada, Quebec, where Quebec is a province that has long seen itself as being under colonial rule for a long time, being under British colonial rule. And some narratives would suggest that even under Canadian colonial rule. But within Quebec, there are innumerable people still undergoing colonialism by Quebec, including many different indigenous communities from the Mi'kmaq to the Métis to the Iroquois to so many different indigenous communities. So what sense can we make of that then where you have a layering effect uh, of colonialism where one colonial rule rules over another one which rules over another one and so on. Now given all this it's important then I think to really get across that it's problematic to think that colonialism can ever just end. It's, it's either its traces are going to still be felt, uh, still going to exist, or its rule is just going to continue, and it's just going to still exert its control. And this is especially true when we consider differently situated people. So people in, like, Quebec, indigenous people currently within colonial Quebec, don't, might not be, see themselves as being under the direct rule of, of a European nation, but, or maybe jump back 100 years under a European nation, but Quebec very much felt itself to be under British rule. And, you know, there may have been indigenous communities who very much felt themselves to also be under that rule. But in any case, the point is that differently situated people are going to have different relationships to colonial rule. Now, some Marxists have raised issues with such proclamations because they make it too, this, the, the, this idea makes it too complicated. When we begin to consider differently situated people, we consider the experiences of women, 
of indigenous people, of other marginalized people in different settings, what we are erasing is the common thread between them all, according to Marxists. And that is at that at the core of colonialism today and over the past few hundred years has been a drive for profit. And colonialism has been inspired by the intensification of capitalism and its many exploitative logics. But remember, and this is my own issue with some strands of Marxist thought, and we'll get into it more as we go along, is that it is just obsessed with one explanation for all issues. The communism or doom narratives bore me to death, and I also just find that they're totally unsatisfactory when it comes to actually considering the way that oppression operates against specific people in specific settings. Not to denigrate it, it's one explanation among many, and it has to be taken very seriously, but it's important to consider other things as well. Now, within post-colonial discourse, there's also a risk that colonized people, the colonized people's pasts are going to be erased in an effort to just homogenize colonized people as colonized people, to forget that behind that label are real people with complex histories among themselves, with their cultures, with their own histories, and it's important not to replicate the same colonial trend of trying to assimilate those people and to reduce them to the status of colonized. And by doing that, by trying to instead listen to people, to try to leave room for the exercise of cultural autonomy, for uh, to realize people's own cultural and historical futures, if that's not an oxymoron, then I think that can open up the door for a more beneficial or a more productive field of post-colonial studies, at least in my opinion. And as Spivak says, so uh, Gayatri Spivak, though it's also important for people not to try to romanticize or reenact a lost past, which can, which can be used for bad things as well. It can be used for evil in an effort to try to redeem a lost past. This can often come at the expense of marginalized people within certain settings, and we'll talk about that more as we go on. Now, to just turn again to Marxism for another second, we're gonna it's going to keep coming up, uh, but one of the really problematic elements of Marxist thought, and this goes from Marx all the way up to Zizek, is the idea that colonialism is a necessary evil, along with capitalism being a necessary evil. And for those that don't know, I've covered Edward Said's Orientalism on this channel, if you're interested in that including a number of other post-colonial texts, texts that belong to that field. But in Edward Said's Orientalism, he presents this passage from Marx in which Marx says that capitalism is necessary for its colonial functions in India to liberate the people from their, essentially from their backwards culture, in order to bring them into the modern day, which is <laughs> very problematic in a number of ways. And Zizek says the exact same thing in his text versus tragedy than his farce, which is, it's all very, it would be comical if it wasn't so scary. Uh, the idea that there can possibly be a silver lining to colonialism. So there are problems within the Marxist tradition for those reasons as well, not just the ones I outlined. Now, with that being said, it's important to recognize that Marxism does offer a fair amount in understanding why colonialism occurs and maybe even how to combat it. And people like Aimé Césaire, France Fanon, has, have taken on this, in some cases has, have taken on Marxism as a way to understand colonial power. Then Lumba goes on a very long journey explaining many different, or presenting many different perspectives on human, human, human agency and human resistance to oppression, eventually linking it to present debates within post-colonial studies. So she begins with Marx, goes from Marx to Gramsci, to Althusser to Foucault, or Althusser to Foucault, to say that all of these thinkers have been steadily moving towards a more dynamic understanding of human agency and resistance, where within Marx, there's almost very little attention provided to individuals in their quest to combat authority. 
it's all about a large hom homogenous group that is the proletarian combating a large homogenous enemy capitalists and capitalism which isn't necessarily bad but it doesn't get at the nitty-gritty of different people's experiences in the world now she moves from considering marx to consider gramsci and gramsci has many different he offers us a lot but largely one of his big contributions is wondering why wondering why the revolution didn't occur in europe the communist revolution and one of the i guess one of the explanations he provides is that capitalism works in such a way as to coerce people not to revolt to through like direct rule in a lot of cases in order to make it so that they do not want to revolt. And there are other contributing factors here. There are combating interests and emerging intelligentsia that work to convince people that everything is okay and there isn't a need to revolt and so on. And then this eventually gives way to the work of Louis Althusser, who says that it is the work of ideology through interpolation as, as one, really one tool, in order to convince people that capitalism is good and that it is natural and then finally she provides a look at Foucault who tries to consider the ways in which power works granularly how power works in many different ways against many different people not just to say that it is ideological in fact he would oppose that kind of explanation I think instead he tries to think of the differing historical factors that have contributed to the emergence of different kinds of control against different people for uh, different reasons. So there was a system, an emerging system within the 17th, 18th century France that he really focuses on that sought to best use people and to make them productive for the various ends that that country at that time wanted to accomplish, be they economic ends, military ends, um, political ends, religious ends. And in order to best operationalize people, it found and deployed new forms of control, one of them being panoptic rule and disciplinary rule that could reduce people to the status of just cogs in the machine, pretty much, and make them operate in such a way as to be beneficial for the op movement enforcement of power. And it does what this happens to do over time is it works to establish a norm that has been standardized through uh, repetition of various believed um, ways to organize people and to ha how they should operate in the world, organize them in such a way as to allow for little resistance. But by virtue of that, it opens up for a lot of possible resistance because it is just so peculiar in how people can exist in the world to the point that almost any deviation from the norm is itself a kind of resistance. So there is room for agency in that in that setting. Whereas to go all the way back again to Marx, it seems like agency can only assume one form, the being a communist, being a worker, working towards uh, participating in the emerging scientific socialism to combat capitalist exploitation. Now, eventually we're going to come to even consider Foucault, but th this steady progression to a more nuanced consideration of resistance also happened to coincide in the 20th century with more people from varying backgrounds entering uh, academia, you know, and entering political life, entering economic life and so on. And so they could share their experiences and they could share all that they know about the way that oppression operates. Now, some of these people in this, some criticisms really emerge within um among like black feminists as just one one possible consideration and other feminists that Foucault's own considerations of power and of resistance fall short and if you read his stuff you you see that there is a, a homogenizing function in that he says almost verbatim he says the panopticon produces homogenous effects of power now there's a lot of nuance to what he he is saying there but throughout the entirety of his work by not considering things like how people are differently affected in terms of their race or because of their race or by their gender, by their class and other considerations, 
Instead, he just replicates the same homogenizing tendency in the consideration of oppression that the previous thinkers had done as well, going all the way back to Marx, in that he doesn't provide a very um, nuanced perspective of different people. Now, I would defend Foucault here uh, just because in all of his analyses, he says very <laughs> specifically, he's only looking at a very specific time frame in a very specific country and doesn't suggest that any of his ideas are necessarily applicable to any other setting. He's very clear about that, despite the academic tendency to just apply his thought willy-nilly anywhere and to say that it, you know, this can apply to the United States or something like that, which might be true, but that's not what he had in mind. In any cases, there were other people who took up Foucault in emerging studies of oppression, including anti-colonial and post-colonial studies, took up Foucault to understand how discourse, how normative standards operate to continually denigrate the other, the quote-unquote other, the person or people who are oppressed by colonialism. So for example, Edward Said takes up Foucault to discuss how the Orient, the Middle East, is constructed by Europe and by Europeans. But then other people, like Homi Baba, have been clear that and if you're listening to this, you, you might know I released an episode, God, because I do these in advance, so I don't know when they come out, maybe a week ago, about two weeks ago, I don't know, about the distinction between Edward Said and Homie Baba, if you're curious in that. Uh, in that. But Baba comes along and says, uh, Edward Said, you reduce the dynamic between colonizer and colonized to, to a too simple of a binary. And by doing that, you reduce the autonomy of colonized people and say that they are always already determined by the colonizer instead of leaving room for agency on the part of the colonized and to really nuance that, you know, these possible interactions. And it's just, it's reductive to say that all people within the Occident, the West, are just the West, they embody the West, and people in the Orient just embody the Orient at least according to the, the discursive practices of constructing each. What that does is it, it erases the real material existences and other even textual and discursive forms of resistance that oppose these, uh, these brands, that oppose these ways to characterize people. Now, in this kind of scuffle between Said and Baba, or Baba's criticism of Said, Lumba is a little bit sympathetic to Said, as, as anyone should be. I mean, his work was foundational, but does find it strange in his work that he doesn't consider modes of oriental resistance given his Foucauldian roots. And all throughout his text, he suggests that, you know, he's a Foucauldian, that he's using Foucault's theories to understand um, orientalism. But at the same time, he leaves little room to consider resistance that always accompanies power, which is power, which is central to Foucault's theses. Foucault is very clear that resistance accompanies power. So it's strange then that Said just submits the colonized, people who are subject to power, submits them to this overarching, uh, unchallenged, uh, and really unchanging Occidental rule without acknowledging the possibility of, possibility of resistance. In fact, even going so far as to say that he's not interested in that. He's just interested in the way that the Orient is constructed, which is just is a little bizarre. because so you, you have to consider the responses to that as well. Now she turns from considering different, um, the kind of roots of post-colonial theory from Marx to Foucault and the, some figures within post-colonialism to now consider um, how colonialism intensifies earlier logics of insider-outsider differences. So the idea of there being outsiders to one's culture is not new. And it would be wrong to say that Europe just created this, these distinctions. That would be naive. But colonialism, and especially European colonialism, intensify these logics of insider and outsider to an unprecedented degree. And it makes sense that a colonial enterprise would want to do this because it's evil 
And what it wants to do is to better manage and control people. And there's not one of the best ways to do that is to generate this image of the outsider, the one exterior to your own culture, imbue them with a number of characteristics and attributes that are unsavory to your culture. And then from there, you can make it all the more easily easy to justify ruling over them and imposing your values onto them because under the moniker of civilizing them or of Christianizing them, you know, anything that would be considered more enlightening than however they are in the world. Now, what Europe did really well, though, as far as its evil agenda went, is it began to attach this kind of logic of insider and outsider to a scientific justification to suggest that the outsider group had certain characteristics on the, largely on the basis of race uh, that were just biological. That black people, for example, within African countries had certain attributes and that therefore they couldn't be changed. There was no possible way to um, make it so that they could be, <laughs> you could possibly reform them. And this was a logic that was extended to indigenous peoples in the Americas as well and to Middle Eastern people and so on. And this is just one example of one of the contradictions of colonialism in that it suggests that there are innate biological differences, but at the same time, it is necessary for Europe to assimilate these people. So these, these, both of these ideas conflict with one another in that on the one hand, it says they can't change, but on the other hand, that they were going to change them, which is, which, you know, colonialism is evil, but it's also stupid. And this is kind of falls out of the purview of what we're doing here. But there were people at the time that were very critical of colonialism, people who you might not expect, including Adam Smith. And a while ago, I covered his text, The Wealth of Nations, on here. And there's a very long passage in it in which he very much rallies against colonialism for two reasons. He says that it infringes upon the rights of people who are being colonized, because that's not very cool. Uh, I mean, it's... it's horrible, uh, which is strange coming from Adam Smith, while at the same time you have Karl Marx saying that colonialism is good, so just get wrap your head around that, and or not at the same time, coming after him, of course. But anyways, wrap your head around that. And he's also saying that it is just bad economically, because if you have a population that are forced to work through slavery, you're not going to have a population that's actually going to be able to buy commodities that you want to make on a massive scale, which is one of the problems that capitalism constantly confronts. On the one hand, it wants to reduce wages as much as possible because it won't, the capitalists want to make as much money as possible. But if they do that too much, they're not going to have a population that is able to actually buy the products that they are making. So slavery is was bad for Adam Smith. And I'm not defending Adam Smith. He was a reprehensible dude. He was racist. He had, he had horrible views in every single way. But this is just one thing where he was like, he drew the line at colonialism, which to his credit, it's a good thing. Now, anyway, I digress. So science. Science! European colonialism sought to organize people on the basis of scientific differences, bio, innate biological differences. And this played out in negative, many negative ways, like in Rwanda, separating people, uh, Hutus from Tutsis, so that they would this would eventually culminate into you know one of the worst conflicts ever um, in Rwanda, which is horrible to even discuss. But this was largely due to European involvement in that area and separating people on the basis of their biological difference differences between uh, Hutus and Tutsis. Now, as with Homi Baba, it would be important to say that science was not just a purely European invention. I mean, many of its central tenets came from other places, like the Middle East, like India, like other places. And within the colonial encounter, there were many instances in which colonized people would teach the colonized Euro colonizing Europeans about how science. They would teach people how to actually navigate waters. They would teach the Europeans how to actually build dams, build aqueducts, and other structures to best use the land, how to use the lunar cycle in the most effective ways, and, and other things like that. 
and what this did or what it's why this is important to consider is that it would be a huge erasure to just say that Europe had this thing this monolithic thing called science that it used against other people because that reduces what science is and it implies that anything anyone else does is not science and it's like some kind of um more like childlike not developed form of thinking when it is extremely important and valuable for for many different reasons but just doesn't enter into isn't classified as a science just because of an exclusionary mechanism that tries to gatekeep what can count as science versus what counts as just being religion or superstition or something else so there is some value in thinking about the colonial engagement as one of a hybrid as being a hybrid encounter and this is an idea that really um, developed with homie baba but there is a kind of giving and taking that occur between colonized people and colonizers this isn't to, to erase the violence inflicted uh, i would hope no one would think that but it's about leaving room for the agency and really how impressive it is that even within colonialism people manage to exert their own agency they still manage to realize their culture and to retain their culture in the face of these horrors and literature has been one way for colonized people to still engage with their cultures to still produce art in the form of literature but this it goes both ways i mean europeans would use literature as well to encourage more colonialism so for example shakespeare uh and his um play the tempest where tempests are framed as hurricanes which might relate to the french term tempête which is like a storm uh which were connected to associated with the caribbean and it was meant to also convey the idea of caribbean or the people being there as being chaotic as being storm-like and one of the central figures in that text caliban uh is an anagram for cannibal which and these might be reaching like i don't know if that's what shakespeare intended but you know we, we also don't need to look at such speculative examples as shakespeare's the tempest uh you know we can just look at other texts like joseph conrad's heart of darkness which despite its efforts is in itself a pretty racist text uh there's henry Ryder haggard's uh she if you which you, if you haven't read is about a journey into the heart of africa which is very problematic these white europeans go in there and just do whatever they want they don't care i mean it's just it's up for it's up for grabs now or literature could have been used as a form of indoctrination to indoctrinate colonized people to the colonizers ways of being in the world however sometimes this would backfire and for example in india the english texts were used to bolster indian autonomy so they would use the bible in some cases as a way to justify Indian autonomy away from Europe. So it would actually fly back in their faces through a kind of mimicry, another term from Baba. So opinions on the use of colonial uh, language and cultures would vary as well. Where Chinua Achebe, which I hope to God I'm pronouncing somewhat right, Chinua Achebe, uh, who wrote the text um, Things Fall Apart, which is a very good book, uh, which I really rec recommend. He sees value in using a colonial language like English, writes in English, in order to convey his Kenyan experience. Whereas someone like um, Gugiba Thiongo would use, would refuse to use a colonial language for the reason that it was a colonial language, who would prefer to write and speak in his language, uh, Guyu, which I I hope I'm pronouncing these names correctly. I did my research and funny, st I, I won't tell the story now. One time I just did all this research and how to pronounce a name and I, I got it wrong. So I, I researched how to pronounce names, but sometimes I, they, for some reason I get unlucky and all the resources I, I consult happen to all be wrong and then I'm left with egg on my face. So if my pronunciation is wrong, please let me know. I'd love to hear about it. So it's important that post-colonial analyses don't take the textual and the material to be separate. It's important to acknowledge how literature can influence material effects in the world and how material effects in the world can influence literature. They very much go hand in hand. Where words are images, uh, words and images are material and political, 
in that they lend justification for material acts. And that wraps up chapter one. So next time we're going to take up chapter two, three in the conclusion. And uh, yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. Uh, you can leave five stars on a podcast platform. That'd be cool. Or a review. That'd be even cooler. And yeah, on that note, take care.